We will come back. Dr. Wong, Dr. Puna Wong, he'll be sharing with us chapter 5 of the book, Breaking the Myth of Religious Faith. Dr. Wong, to you. Good evening, Namo Buddhaya. This sharing tonight is taken from chapter 5 of this book, and it is with regard to what people call faith. Faith in the Buddha Dharma is certainly not blind. An unquestioning faith is not a feature of the Buddha's teachings. Now we must realize that the Buddha Dharma is an education and the Buddha aims to transform us to a noble way of life. Buddhism, the religion, was created by subsequent generations of people. If you look at a dictionary, a religion is described as an organized system of beliefs, rites, and celebrations centered on a supernatural being or power, a belief which is pursued with devotion to this being. Now, the ideal state for the student of the Buddha Dharma is that there is nothing to believe in. For the student of the Buddha Dharma must know for himself or herself. When people take refuge in theistic religions, they take refuge in an external power, thinking that an external power will save them, bail them out, etc. When we take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, we are not taking refuge in any external power we are taking refuge in wisdom, the wisdom to know what to do. So the teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma, is firstly not a religious faith, because firstly the Buddha is not a supernatural being in the way that most people think. He is a man who perfected himself, and he is all natural. He is a man who developed complete understanding of the workings of the mind and the realities of life and nature. And because he is a man who perfected himself, then we too can perfect ourselves guided by his teachings. The Buddha is not a god or a deva for one to believe in. The Buddha is a teacher who teaches us the way to wisdom and understanding, and in the process, letting go of greed, hatred, and ignorance, which blinds us. If there is an indicator of how much we, his students, had progressed, it is that in looking within ourselves, we will see our cravings, our ego, and our conceit will progressively lesson as we walk this path. The Buddha at the very apex of the evolution of the mind has no need for praise or offerings or devotion because he has no desire, no ego or conceit. The Dhamma that the Buddha taught for 45 years is education and in fact the only miracle that the Buddha accepts is the miracle of the transformation of a person from a not so wholesome human being to a wholesome or noble human being. The Dhamma is basically the psychology and the science of the human mind. It is the teachings of the Buddha which illuminates the path to our awakening from many delusions including the delusions of self, ego, pride, conceit, I, my, and mine. The very first verse in the Dhammapada says, if with a pure mind a person speaks or acts, happiness follows him like his never departing shadow. The first and second verse talks of a pure mind and an unpure mind. The unpure mind then dukkha or unhappiness or stress will follow him like the wheels which follow the bullock. These two verses were the very verses which 
brought me into the Buddha Dharma. It does not speak of an external force that we praise or bribe. It speaks of our own self. It says that if you want to have happiness, then you act with a pure mind. And if you do things with an unwholesome mind, then don't blame anybody when this deep, when this ease and stress follows us. This brings the entire ability to change our future into our own hands, not into the hands of another being, an external force, a god or a deva, but into our own hands. Secondly, his teachings do not constitute a religious faith because faith in the Buddha's teachings is not blind. An unquestioning faith is in fact discouraged. And the way of the Dhamma is far from superstition. The Buddha is a teacher who taught us that whatever he teaches us, we must verify for ourselves before we accept it. He taught a group of monks and the Venerable Sariputta, his chief disciple, was seated at his feet. At the end of his discourse, he asked the Venerable Sariputta, do you believe in what I just said? And the Venerable Sariputta replied, no, Lord, until I have verified it myself. Now, any other teacher would have thrown the student out, probably excommunicated him. But the Buddha, in fact, praised the Venerable Sariputta he has the right attitude, and that is the attitude all of us must have of questioning, asking, and seeing for ourselves. We can well reject any superstition as not the teaching of the Buddha. And the Buddha demands that we use our common sense, our direct experiential evidence, and see for ourselves. If I were to tell you that you have two hands, and two feet. And you believe me, that is fate. But if you look yourself and see that you indeed have two hands and two feet, then you do not need to have faith in me, neither do you need to believe me. For now, you know. This is exactly what the Buddha wanted us to have. See for ourselves all the core teachings that he has taught us and verify it. The Buddha wants us to know, and this is the principle of Ehi Pasiko. Come and investigate and experience for yourself. This is the scientific basis of his pedagogy. So when we say faith within the Buddha Dharma, confidence in the Buddha's teachings would be a more appropriate description as we can verify these lessons directly ourselves. Thirdly, the Buddha's teachings do not form a religion because initially there were no rites and rituals for lay people. However, because of human needs, much man-made rites and rituals evolved to be practiced in the name of Buddhism. But even these are not centered on the divine being, but rather on and for the people attending the assemblies. The five precepts, for example, they are entirely secular moral precepts which we recite to remind ourselves of the red lights that could possibly give us danger should we race across it. Puja. Many people think puja means to pray. But puja doesn't mean to pray. Puja means, more closely in English, to honour someone. And we do pujas to pay our respect to a great teacher. And these have an educational purpose because it reminds us of the noble qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And hence, understanding what we chant is very, very important. We should not just parrot the words understand it. That is crucial. Now, the Buddha doesn't need us to praise him. These that we do are for us. And in fact, the Buddha clearly stated 
that the highest honor to him is not material offerings, not offering of fruits or flowers or candles, but we, his students, living the life that he taught us, living a morally wholesome life and following what is taught in the Dhamma as applied to our daily lives. Being imperfect, unenlightened beings, we naturally need these rites and rituals for psychological support and also for, communi for communal activities. However, as one progresses on the path, its importance progressively diminish. And instead, that light within, that spiritual light within, that wisdom of the Dhamma becomes brighter and brighter. The student of the Buddha Dharma has only one aim, the end of greed, hatred and ignorance, and this leads to true happiness. There is no leap of faith and no dogma in the Buddha's pristine teachings. You and I can question every teaching. We can ask why for everything that is taught to us. And what the Buddha taught is reality, which any one of us can verify even by ourselves. And the Buddha, in fact, challenged all of us to see for ourselves and not take even his words on faith. O oh, Bishus and the wise, just as a goldsmith tests his gold by burning, cutting, and rubbing it, so must you examine my words and accept them, but not merely out of reverence. His teachings are priceless gems which anyone can confidently verify for himself. There is no closed fist, no secret. The Dhamma is available for all of us to see. And in this time and age of the information technology, at the click of your button to Sutra Central, for example, the entire canon is available. And while there may be 84,000 Dhamma teachings as described by the Venerable Ananda, let us remember that the core teachings of the Buddha is very simple. In Chinese, we often say, 84,000 Dhamma dolls. In the Theragatha, the Venerable Ananda said, 82,000 taught by the Buddha, 2,000 by his disciples. But let us remember that within these 84,000 Dhamma doors, the very heart of it, the very core of it, is eight for the Eightfold Path, four for the Four Noble Truths, and zero, zero, zero representing the three characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not-self. These are the core teachings of the Buddha. This is what we need to know, we need to apply in our daily lives. Let us study the Dhamma. Let us apply the Dhamma and not worship the Dhamma. Let us move away from superstitions and use our logic. The Buddha told the first 60 Arahants who went out to share the Dhamma, you and I, he said, are now freed from all human and divine bondage. The Buddha said, we are now freed. You are freed when you understand the Dhamma. Not just from human bondage, but also from divine bondage. Let there not be superstition. Any woman can be equally enlightened. Any woman can clean the Buddha image. Any woman can wash and tidy the altar. All these superstitions are human bondages which the Buddha wanted us to realize is not true. Always remember that what the Buddha taught us, the Dhamma, is the raft for which we use to progress. It is the raft for us to lessen pain and suffering, to lessen greed, anger, hatred, to lessen conceit, pride and ignorance. It is the vehicle. We use a vehicle. You don't pray to a vehicle. It is not another object of pride and division for us to say 
Only I am right, you are wrong. Only my lineage is right, your lineage is wrong, etc. Sad things within the Buddhist community. Let us go back to the Dhamma. Go back to what the Buddha taught and realize that there is only one path, the Buddha Yana, the path which leads us to less pain, less suffering, less dukkha. With the setting of the sun and the ebbing of the tide, with the relentless march of time, ask ourselves, what have we done? How much time do we have left today? Look at our hair. There's not much of it left. Let us make full use of our time, full use of our opportunities, learn and practice the Dhamma. Thank you. Thank you to all who have contributed to this book. Thank you to all who encouraged me. Thank you to all my Kayana meters in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. As I posted this morning, I am nothing but the spiritual friends who support me. I don't have any resource other than spiritual friends who say, please go on, we will support you. To all my Kayana meters, you are my Buddha. When I look at you, I see the Buddha. I see that shining light within you. And I want to take this opportunity to say thank you. I want to take this opportunity to say sorry for all the things I might have done which might have offended you. I want to thank you all for supporting this Buddha Sasana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, uh, we come to the question and answer session. Uh, if there's any question and uh, answer, there's any question, can you please post in the Facebook? And we will then read out to the speakers here today. Um, I have um, to start. I have a, one question uh, in which I'd like to direct uh, the question to both the speaker, uh, Dr. Puna Wong and Didi Huat Chai. I think it's the same question, but I think probably the two of you can have a different answer to that. Um, I'll, maybe we'll start with Dr. Puna Wong. In doing Dhamma Dutta work, especially when we are doing alone, there are many obstacles and we made many complaints. And sometimes because of that, we face the, of the obstacle that we face, our fate will weaken. Our energy will be snapped off. How can we overcome this? Maybe we start with Dr. Wong. Thank you, Didi. Now, the Buddha was asked about the spiritual life by the Venerable Ananda. The Venerable Ananda felt that half the spiritual life is noble spiritual friends. And the Buddha corrected him and said, No, Ananda, spiritual friends are the entire spiritual life. Because spiritual friends encourage us to keep to the noble path, raise us up when we are down, and drag us when we fall into unwholesome states. I think it is very important that a community be present for us to do such work because being alone, as Brother SK said, one can sometimes be discouraged when people put up hindrances or pass very hurtful remarks. Unless one is very strong spiritually, with a mind that is very calm, literally ru ru putong, a mind that is unaffected by negative remarks and emotions, i.e. a mind that is very highly trained, I fully agree that it can be difficult and it can, in fact, be discouraging. So I think that it is very important that first, there must be a strong foundation within ourselves, that we understand the Dhamma clearly, and that we have a degree of calmness within us so that we are less affected by such negative remarks or comments or texts and 
then we proceed. And every time we need help, do not be shy to voice it out to our Kayala meters. The world is so connected today that it is hard to believe that there is somebody who is truly alone. Because even though another friend or supporter may not be physically in the vicinity, we are connected by the internet, by WhatsApp, etc. So I think that this would help the problem of being discouraged. A communal activity where one meets face to face and share the Dhamma with each other, of course, is the ideal. But sometimes in this era of COVID-19, for example, that may be a little difficult. Thank you very much. Um, can we hear the sharing, uh, the sharing from uh, Didi Huat Chai? It's a very good question uh, about doing Dhamma Dutta work and get this courage. Uh, I think I've been doing Dhamma Dutta work for the last 40 over years. And I must say it's not an easy task to do Dhamma Dutta work. Uh, it takes a lot of energy and people suck the energy away from you. You have to keep building new energies to do your Dhamma Dutta work. But for those people who are keen to do Dhamma Dutta work, I have three words to share with you. First is called passion. Uh, we must have passion for the Dhamma. The Pariyati, Patipati and Pativera, these three things will boost out our passion for the Dhamma. You learn the Dhamma, you practice and you realize the Dhamma. The second word I want to say for anybody who wants to do Dhamma to do is called uh, motivation. This motivation comes through the inspiration we get by learning the life of the Buddha of his 45 years of how he has reached out to the people who needs the Buddha did not preach. The Buddha reached out to people. And that gives a lot of inspiration, which I call motivation to do Dhamma Dutta work. And the last word is called mission. Uh, we can't do Dhamma Dutta work if we don't have a strong sense of mission. The issue with a lot of Buddhist community today, in a lot of Buddhist society, they are running activities. They are not doing with a sense of mission. So if we have passion, if we have motivation inspired by the Buddha, and we have a sense of mission. I think no matter what happens to, our, to us, we will always find a lot of inner peace, a lot of inner energy to continue to do our Dhamma Dutta work. So that's my little sharing with you about, you know, if you want to continue to do Dhamma Dutta work, don't be discouraged. Uh, I mean, if you look at it from the other bigger perspective, there are Maras everywhere trying to discourage us to do good, to do things which benefits a lot of people. But we must not uh, be afraid of our direction and our mission. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Didi Hua Chai, for the, uh, for the sharing. Uh, i just like to make an announcement that the ebook link has been posted in the comment section of each group. So if you need to uh, download the ebook, just uh, go to the link and download it. Now, um, my next question uh, here it will be to Dr. Puna Wong. Breaking myth 25, where do we go from here? Breaking myths 25. We actually started with 10 articles. And from 10 articles, it went to 20 articles, and then 25 articles. And then I said, OK, I think I should stop. And then I met Didi Hua Chai at a dinner. And he said, no, 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 no. There must be a book two and a book three. Now, I will be very honest. It takes a lot of work. Sister Siwin and I have spent countless hours reading, rereading, checking, rechecking, because we had to ensure that what we write is first and foremost correct, and second, that there are no errors in our typo. And I think it will give us great encouragement if people are to read the book, put a line in our Facebook or somewhere that we can see it, and then we will find the strength to go on. When I mentioned to Sister Siuyin about book two, her reaction is an icon which goes <laughs> like that, because it truly is a lot of work. And as I said earlier, we are very grateful to Suki Honto. Suki Honto is a great organization in Malaysia that has been so supportive, and Sister Doreen had gave us a lot of advice on how to make that book a proper book because we don't know what a proper book is like, 
our arrangement sequence, etc., was very amateurish, like a school magazine, as I said. And it was an indeed a good experience because from this we learned how to do it. Breaking Myths, Book 2. Give me a month break at least and then we will continue. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, you stay back because the next question is directed to you. Some Chinese believe that the seven days after that seven days after death, the spirit soul of the deceased will return to his or her home. Is this mere superstition? Or is there a scientific parapsychological basis for this? Any of any mention of this in the Buddha's teaching? Okay. Dhamma brothers and sisters, there is a need for us to appreciate the difference between Dhamma, what is taught by the Buddha, and culture, and our own Chinese traditions, of course. If we are following the Buddha Dharma strictly, then in the Buddha Dharma, there is no mention of a seven day or a 49 day. However, it appears in the Buddha Dharma that there seem to be an intermediate state even within the Pali Canon. The doctrine of immediate rebirth comes from the Abhidharma and also as a conclusion of the Third Buddhist Council. But if we look within the Pali Canon, there are snippets whereby it is in fact implied that some people will have an intermediate state and that rebirth may not be instantaneous. That of course is a topic which is too big to be discussed tonight in a question and answer session. Seven days or 49 days is very cultural. The Chinese have it, the Thais also believe in it. Now we must remember that we are conditioned beings. Our future is conditioned in a way by our thoughts, our beliefs, what we are attached to, our upadanas. So we become, in many sense, what we are attached to. So if you are very attached to in your life, that I'm going to come back on the seventh day or 49th day or whatever in your culture, then you jolly well may because that is what you have created your future to be. But if you ask me in a true or false multiple choice question, is this in the Buddhist canon, in the Pali canon, then I will have to say no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, there's another question. Should Buddhist followers be vegetarian? Is there any mention in the Buddha's teaching? Uh, Dr. Wong? Oh. Alright, this is a very good question and a question which is raised to us many times in Dhamma Dutta work. Now we must first bring all of us back 2,600 years ago. 2,600 years ago in Northeast India, society is basically very agrarian. It was a society where people live off the land, traders would take what the farmers grow and sell. And the Sangha will go on the morning arms round, accepting what is offered by the householders. Now, this was the practice, the Buddha said, not just by him, but by all the Buddhas even before him. And the venerable Devadatta was the one venerable who actually proposed to the Buddha that the Sangha must follow a strict vegetarian diet, to which the Buddha actually declined. The Buddha did not want to make that a Vinaya rule. In his great wisdom, he probably thought it inappropriate because there might be situations where no vegetarian food may be available. And the Buddha said that the monks will accept whatever the householders offer in the morning arms round. If they so wish not to eat meat, that's their personal choice. They just don't eat it. That's it. Now, there is a discourse with the 
name of Divaka Sutta. Divaka was the Buddha's personal physician. And Dr. Divaka actually did discuss this with the Buddha. This is well documented. And the Buddha gave us guidelines. Now, in Buddhism, everything is re relation to the training of the mind. The Buddha gave guidelines to the Sangha. In Chinese, it became known as the San Jing Ro, the three pure meats, in which the Sangha cannot eat the meat of an animal if the Sangha had seen, for example, that animal being slaughtered, because then it would have a big impact on their mental makeup negatively. Similarly, even if the Sangha is to suspect that the householder intentionally killed that animal for him, then that Sangha member is to politely decline by putting his hand above the arm's bow. That, of course, also refers to the possibility that if he consumes that meat, he may feel guilty. So if he has seen it or heard it, or suspect it, then he should decline. Other than that, the householder, when they offer whatever is excess in their household to the bhikkhus or bhikkhunis, they are to accept it with gratitude. As I said earlier, we are all at different levels of cultivation. Many of us still need rites and rituals. Some do not need rites and rituals. A sotapan might even see it as a fetter. Similarly, with regards to dietary uh, manners, if a person feels guilty that he or she should not take meat for whatever reasons, health reasons, or if he thinks that because that animal has to be killed for him, then by all means, don't eat, because it is the effect on our mind state which is important. But for someone who says, no, I think he's all right, then he can buy it off the supermarket, buy it off the shelf, but certainly it should not be killing a live animal for himself. All right, thank you. On the same question, uh, can we have uh, Didi Huachai to give his comment? Uh, vegetarianism is a very interesting topic in Buddhism and there's a lot of misconception that a Buddhist must strictly be a vegetarian. Uh, I think if we follow the life of the Buddha, we know in many instances the Buddha did not impose that Buddhist must be a vegetarian. Uh, the question always asked in our community, especially among the Chinese and the Chinese Buddhists, is because they tend to associate Buddhism with vegetarianism. But to me, we have to understand the cultural development and the religious development across the years. So when Buddhism went over to China at that time, and uh, China, Buddhism started to have a lot of uh, a strong footing in China, and a lot of them became monks and a uh, monastery was built over a period of time. And because of that, uh, you find that, uh, you know, when, uh, in fact, Buddhism was flourishing in China, and uh, uh, the monks, uh, they could not get the kind of food that they, they, they can get when they are in, in, in India, for example. The, the Indians are very different from the Chinese. The Indians will give any food to any holy man. But the Chinese may not you know, necessarily want to do that, especially for monks. They look at, sometimes they even treat them as if they are beggars and things like that. So the monks, as they grow in numbers in China, they have difficulty of finding food. And as they stay in monastery, they cannot be rearing chickens and other animals and slaughter and eat. So the only sensible thing for most of the monks at that point in time is to plant vegetables, beans and, you know, fruits and whatever that they can plant and eat. And uh, that's why in, in Chinese, there is a proverb uh, at that time, it's called Sen Duo Zhou Sao. A lot of monks, but not enough porridge for them. That proverb come in a time when Buddhism was flourishing in China. So when the monks were basically uh, practicing what they practice and the food that they eat basically are veggie, vegetarian based, and in, in China in those days, the temple and monastery doesn't open 24 hours and every day. They only open in a certain period of time. And normally in the new moon and full moon period, the, the temple and monastery doors are open for lay devotees to go in. And that's where a lot of lay people start to know, oh, 初一十五, 吃斋. 
is because that's the time uh, culturally they went over to the monastery and they were given treated well by giving those food prepared by the monks and they are all vegetarian food and that's how basically our forefathers when we came from China over here we start to associate you know vegetarianism and Buddhism but actually it's a lot more you have to understand the cultural development over the years as Buddhism go over to China so I think uh, we have to be very clear but if you go to the life of the Buddha the Buddha did not impose that all Buddhists should be a vegetarian of course if you want to do that for uh, various reasons of you know cultivating your compassion by all means do so yeah. okay uh, Didi Huachai um, there's one question here as a Dhamma Dutta how do we deal with people who are superstitious and mistaken it to be uh, to be part of Buddhism. I believe he, they are talking more of the uh, some of the wrong faith, the wrong blind faith. Uh, another good question. Uh, I think the reason we Buddhists do Dharma outreach or we call Dharma Dutta is not because we want to convert people uh, within the Buddhist community itself, within the Malaysian Buddhist so-called Buddhist community itself, there are many misconceptions about Buddhism. And I think our role as Dharma uh, outreach and uh, missioners, we, we should be there to basically clarify a lot of this misconception. That's what Breaking Myth book, uh, purpose, the purpose of writing that book is by Dr. Puna is basically to clarify some of these issues. And I think uh, being a Dhamma Dutta, that's what we need to do is not to convert people, but to clarify some of these misconceptions. And uh, that's why we're doing Dharma Dutta work. It's not because we are out there to see how many people we can convert to become Buddhists. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Didi Huachai. Thank you very much. Uh, all right there brothers and sisters um, we have come to the end of our session today